Um, hi, everyone. I'm pleased to see so many people here for a talk on ontologies. Surprise. <laughs> uh, maybe everyone's come here for the uh, Olympians who are next. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, ontologies and uh, data standards and why you know, we feel that they're important for building the sort of high quality data sets that you need to be able to you know, run your, your successful AI. Um, so first a bit about Elsevier. So Elsevier is a content and a data company. Its um, a mission statement is to help researchers and healthcare professionals advance science and improve health outcomes for the benefit of society. And we do this with our scientific content. So that's journals, highly curated data sets, um, and our technologies and so our software. And that's the bit we do at SciByte, which is a sort of a, a part of Elsevier. And that's what I'm going to concentrate mostly on today. So right now, everything we talk about with respect to data is seen through the prism of AI, right? You can see that from all of the names of the, the stages here. Um, and I've been in this field, I've been in the, the field of semantics and ontologies and fair data for 20 years, and we've been talking about these principles of, you know, well-structured, high-quality data for that whole time. And, you know, it's slowly taken, uh, you know, it's, it's, people have started to adopt that slowly. But the, the advent of, of AI and, and sort of the, the rise of generative AI has put that, that process onto overdrive, right? Because, you know, you need to be able to pull out the data you require to train your AI. So, you know, you have to be able to pull that out when you need it um, and the right data. So, yeah, so this is the take home. AI runs on data. If you want to train your AI, you need to give it the right data at the right time. And businesses obviously want to, to, to leverage this. They want to you know, adopt these technologies, but they've turned around to look at their kind of data infrastructure and gone, oh no, this is in a terrible state. We can't pull out the pieces of data that we need because our data governance, our data structure, our data processes aren't, uh, aren't allowing that. The infrastructure just doesn't allow it. And there's lots of reasons for this. I mean, the sort of the core one is that data is siloed. And those silos take many forms. So they can be institutional. They can be different departments. They can be to do with people, to do with management. They're often to do with uh, software, to do with platforms. Um, and so, you know, data lives in platforms and it's usually hard to get it out. It's very hard to get it to interoperate. Um, so even if you can pull it out, you can't make those data sets work together. You can't re-slice them in the ways that you need to, to be able to get those specific distinct data sets. Um, and then finally, you know, you don't know, and this is especially true for data you're bringing in, am I allowed to use it? What am I allowed to do with this data? Who owns it? Do I have the copyright on it? And that's especially important for the industry we're in, in, in the pharma industry, which is really regulated. Um, so Conway's law, uh, this was coined by uh, Melvin Conway in 1967, and he's a software developer. But these, you know, this same principle applies to, to data, to, uh, to most fields in technology as well. And essentially, it's saying that the, 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 what you build, the technology you build, will come to resemble the organization itself. So those departments, you know, that, that it'll be delineated, it'll be shaped by those sort of those social... Uh, those social uh, uh, structures. Data normalization is also an issue. Um, so the same thing um, called different things um, in different places. And you know, this, this is from, this is a life science example. So I used to work at the European Bioinformatics Institute and this is from one of our databases. And it was you know, an unconstrained free text field where you had to describe your sample. And this was all of the ways that people entered to describe their sample as being male. So I do 60 different ways. And, you know, this is specific to life sciences, but I'm sure that in other industries you see something similar. If you don't constrain those sorts of fields, then you end up with this sort of mess that, that you then have to reconcile um, as legacy data. So over the last 
sort of 10 years, we've seen a trend um, of, well, certainly in life sciences, of wanting to pull data together out of its respective sort of data silos and platforms into one big pile, which we call a data lake, right? And I think it's fair to say, at least in the life sciences, that has met with limited success. And I think the reason is that having, it, having that data in the same place isn't, isn't sufficient, right? You have to... You have to have some understanding of, of that data and how it can be used in conjunction. So just bringing it into one place isn't enough. You have to have, a, have, have it annotated to the same standards and in order that it can interoperate. So more recently, um, there's been a move towards data products. And I see there's you know, lots of companies who are talking about data products now. And data products, are, it's better, right? Because the P, they're, they're data sets that are maintained and developed by the people who are very, very close to that data. Um, and they have their own standards there, they're, you know, they're maintained. Um, and so that they're super useful for a particular um, application. The, the challenge is, and they sort of operate within a data mesh, but the, the challenge is, if you, unless you're annotating those, those um, sets with the same standards, you still can't use them together. Um, so, as this is a general audience, and um, I didn't want to have to explain like life sciences and ontologies at the same time, I thought I'd take a real-world example to explain why you know I think that standards, semantics, ontologies are important. So um, we should all be eating more plants in our diets, right? So um, this is a question that I might want to ask. Um, in in semantics, when we're building like a new ontology for a project we start with what we call a competency question. So rather than saying, I'm going to build a, an ontology and it's going to be big and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to do everything, um, I'm, I'm rather I'm going to say, I'm going to start with the data um, and what questions might I want to ask of my data. And then that will give me, you know, I can go back to that question at the end and see whether I've been successful. So when I've annotated my data into that ontology, if I can answer my question, then that project's been successful. So this is my competency question. What proportion of my total grocery spend is plant-based for, say, I don't know, a year? Um, so start with my data. So these are my data sets. I've got two that are digital already. I've got some web um, orders from Ocado. I've got some web orders from Tesco. I've got some non-digital data. I've got a bunch of receipts that I, I got from various shops where I bought groceries. And then I, went to, I know that I went to the greengrocer and bought some stuff, but I, I didn't record it. Um, so this is, you know, this is a good representation of the sort of data we see regularly. Um, so you know, it's got gaps. Some of it's easy to use. Some of it's less easy to use. It's hard to combine. So let's start with the low-hanging fruit, the websites. Um, so this is a Cardo, and you can see that they've got um, a lovely uh, taxonomy here. This is an ontology. This is the types of things and how they relate to each other. And all of the things that a Cardo sells, are, all of the data is hooked into this ontology. So it's very easy for me to go in and say, oh, OK, I can see some categories here. So I've got there's a fruit category, a vegetable category, and a salads and herbs category. That's basically it, right? That's, that's plants. That pretty much covers it. So I can, as long as I'm able to use the Ocado API, I can hook into that, pull out you know, from my orders everything that I spent using those categories. Happy days. Then on to Tesco. So Tesco also has some semantics, which is great. But unfortunately, they have a, it's kind of different. So for some reason, um, Tesco's has lumped in fresh flowers with vegetables. Um, and sandwich fillers with the salad. So if I want to be able to make that same query, I'm going to have to dive in a little bit and sort of pull out the subcategories, you know, maybe do a little bit of wrangling so in, in order to get my query that pulls out just plants. So it's, it's doable and it's still digital. It's still, you know, it, it, it's, so it's, it's still reasonable, but I'm going to have to do some sort of mapping probably between a Cardo taxonomy and the Tesco taxonomy. Now, onto the receipt. So this is a bit trickier, right? Because it's not digital. So I'm going to have to manually go in and record all of the things that are on this uh, receipt. Um, but that's fine. I can use some optical character recognition, some OCR or something, um, or I can just do it manually. But I need to, I need to add it, and I have to figure out which things are, are, are vegetables, which I can do. Um, but then I need to sort of 
put them in the category somehow. So I need some sort of reference ontology. So um, I found this one. This is a, you know, a public domain ontology. So perhaps if I take these things on my receipt and categorize them underneath my reference ontology, and then I can map the, on, the Ocado ontology onto that and the, ta and the te Tesco ontology onto that. And then I've got everything that's in the same, you know, it's, it's interoperable. Um, and then that allows me to slice data in different ways so I can use the taxonomy itself to, to, to ask additional questions because I've got everything annotated. So I can say, how much did I spend on peppers if I wanted to? Or, um, and then the, the nice thing about ontologies is you can have, within that category, you can have other things associated as well. So other pieces of information, like nutritional information. So I can begin to ask even more detailed questions. Maybe if I wanted to find out how many uh, ultra-processed foods I was eating or high-sugar foods I was eating, I can, it allows me to ask those sort of more nuanced questions. So once I've annotated it once, I've got that, that power to be able to re-slice the data. Um, and then finally, the things I bought at the greengrocers, I didn't record those at the time, so, you know, that's gone. That happens, that's life. Um, but going forward, um, maybe I could use technology to help me. So maybe using my ontology, um, I could build an app powered by that ontology to be able to record things as I bought them. So, you know, it goes in and it's all automatically interoperable with all my other data, um, and I can just, yeah, I can do that on my phone. So this example illustrates some of the kind of challenges that we that we face in the in the life sciences obviously it's this is you know simplified it's much more complex there's a lot of different entity types in life sciences so you know all of the all of the research entities as well as all the different business entities and disease and so on so it's it's super complex but this is kind of a microcosm of how those of how those problems work essentially um, so Talking about good, good practice in data, what do we mean by that? So I mentioned data models. So data models I like to think of as kind of like a form. Um, so in this case, in the shopping case, in my form I might have a few different fields. I've got one for date, and that's fine. That's going to accept you know, a, a number, an integer. Um, I've got one for price. Um, I'll need, I need to fill that in. Uh, and then I've got another field where I'll choose my category. So that's powered by an ontology. And that's my data model, really. That's the minimal data that I need to capture um, in order to be able to, to do my food modeling. Um, so that requires a shared ontology, of course. Um, in this case, it was a really simple one just for food. In reality, it, it's lots of different ontologies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in the life sciences. Um, the data should be captured by people, it should be captured in a timely way by people that understand it in an ideal world. So you, retrospective data tagging is really hard. You don't want to have to go back and, and tag data. You know, I mean, in real life, you have to. But it's, it's much harder to do it that way. It's much easier to tag data as, it, as it's generated by people who understand it best. Um, and finally, Technology is there to make our lives easier, so we should use technology to make the job of recording this data uh, easier. And we use standards in all sorts of other parts of life, right? So this is a USB, where you know it's a standard that allows us to use connectors between different between technologies developed by different vendors, and we use it day to day. And you know without even thinking about it. The same is true of HTTP, which is the web protocol, which we use to be able to use the same browser to access all websites. And they benefit everyone. They benefit the vendors, they benefit the users. So, you know, standards for the win. And the same, the same is true of data. It's in everyone's interest to use those, those common standards. So, moving on to the life sciences where we sit. Um, Pharma is a, a data-rich industry, um, and it's highly regulated, um, as you'd expect. You know, drugs need to be safe, so we have a lot of you know submissions to make to regulators, um, and it's got a super complex structure um, because it's, we're bringing data in. Apologies for the cryptic acronyms here. So, a lot of Research is outsourced in pharma, um, so you're bringing data in from other organizations and you have no control over, you know, really the standards that are used for that data. You're bringing in public data, you're bringing in data from vendors like Elsevier. 
Um, and then you're having to bring put data out as well to to the regulators, to the FDA, the EMA, um, for your regulatory requirements. And you want to be able to um, collaborate with with vendors, software vendors, with academics, and so on. So data needs to be able to move across this kind of ecosystem um, smoothly, um, which is a which is a challenge, because it's as we touched on before, it's siloed. And in pharma, this is the sort of pharma sort of drug discovery pathway. Um, it's, it's siloed by the, the structure of the, you know, of the organization of the drug discovery pathway. So Conway's law again, you know, the, the, the software tends to be, you have platforms for each of these stage, each of these stages. And although you want to be able to track compounds all the way through, for example, you, or diseases or, you know, genes or whatever, you can't do that because of this kind of, um, this very siloed um, uh, structure with lots of uh, barriers to data flow across the business. And talking about ontologies, because in life sciences, in, in drug discovery, the, there's been... Uh, there's been a data challenge. There's always been a data challenge. There's always been a lot of data that needs integrating. And so there are many, many, many terminologies and ontologies, um, which means that for diseases, for example, there are 15 more, you know, around 15 different terminologies. So even if you've got your data tagged with ontologies, there's no guarantee that, you know, different data sets will be tagged with the same ontology. So then you have to map them together. It, it becomes very complex. And so... Um, you know, it needs, it needs skills and uh, tools to be able to do that. So that's where um, our technology comes in. So that's why we, we, we built the tools we, we built. Um, we have, this is the kind of stack that we have at Cybite. Um, at the center we, is, you know, an ontology management platform. So once you have this complex, complex set of, of taxonomies and terminologies, and you know, some which you've built your internally, some which you're pulling from the outside. It needs governance and management to be able to deal with those. And you also need semantic APIs to be able to feed those ontologies into other platforms, which is where you're capturing your data, um, to be able to feed them into things like registration systems so that your scientists can record the data with tagged with the ontologies as they're creating it. Um, so this is a sort of central platform. And then for really, you want to, for pharma, one of the big challenges is there's a lot of legacy data where there's potentially value that you don't know about. And that can be things like lab notebooks, electronic lab notebooks. It can be acquisitions where they bought a company for a particular compound and it's got its own data. And so there's a requirement to be able to, to index that with ontologies um, at scale. Um, and as well as that, the, you know, there's a need to be able to bring in kind of high quality published data, which is where Elsevier comes in um, and cu a highly curated sort of technical data and be able to annotate those with the same terminology so it can all be brought together in the same platform. So once you've tagged all of that stuff, then you can bring it into a search platform or bring it into some analytics platform. All of our tech is API first and it's all modular. So you can choose the pieces you want to use and, you know, make uh, whatever's optimal for your kind of workflow. Um, so, drilling in a little bit to the, the, the text, the legacy text annotation, um, we, in order to be able to do that, um, I mean, we have a rule-based approach, um, it's sort of looking back to the last presentation. So, you know, you, you can do this stuff with LLMs, you can tag up um, data, uh, text with ontology terms with LLMs. It's very slow. It's very expensive. Um, so we have a, a hand curated um, set of what we call vocabularies that we that we build ourselves, um, and they're super fast. They're super cheap to run, and um, yeah. So so that that's what we use. I mean, there there are applications for LLMs, and I think one of the one of the ways we use them is to create new ontologies where there's you know there's a new domain where that doesn't have anything. LLMs, generative AI, is a really quick way to sort of scale that up. Um, and then a human can look through and turn that into something that we can use. Um, but for the actual annotation, this, this rule-based approach we find very effective. So it, it looks like this. We've got some scientific text. It's marked up um, the different entity types. 
Um, and so we pick, we, you see we've picked out um, a disease here and, or an indication um, and a gene. And the, one of the other advantages of using ontologies is you can call the same thing lots of, by lots of different names. So you have a label and then lots of synonyms. So it doesn't matter in the text which one it's called. It normalizes back to an ID. So we always talk about things, things not strings. And then once you've annotated, annotated all of your different sources um, with the same ontologies, you can start to pull them together. So you can imagine um, we can bring in sort of um, Elsevier sources, um, like things like Science Direct, um, Embase, um, alongside um, public like PubMed, uh, Medline, and uh, alongside internal data, lab notebooks, and so on, and pull it all to, into this same semantic space where it can all be um, sort of used in the same queries. So once you've done that, once you've got that semantically indexed knowledge base, um, it allows you to, to, to then layer on top the, 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 the value of generative AI. So what we do in, in our tools is to, take, use, to use the generative AI to translate the question and figure out which of those things in the question are entities and then map those back to our semantic index. So, and then use the, 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 the model itself to interpret the rest. And so you've got the power of both. You've got the, the, the power of the LLM to understand the question, but then you've got the semantic index at the back to be able to, to, ground, to ground what gets returned. So this is uh, one of the platforms, one of our platforms called SciBite Chat. It's brand new. So this sits on top of the semantic search. Um, it, you give it a question. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's very, very small. You, you have to trust me. It's, uh, you give it a question, and then it translates that, you can see there, into um, it, it decides which of those things map to ontologies, um, and then it goes off, tries to retrieve those from, from the database, um, and that can be from all of its different sources, and it's got ranking systems in there to decide which ones come first, you know, which, you know, it, uh, which dates should come before others, that kind, of, so that kind of thing. And then it brings it back, but most importantly, what it returns, it gives you the, 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 the papers and the line that it got the information from. So it's all explainable. So you've got the, the power of the, of the LLM, but you've got the explainability as well. You've got the high quality data behind it. And then because it's generative AI, you can ask follow up questions. So it allows you to have a sort of conversation with your data. You can go sort of back in and sort of ask additional questions and it remembers context. Um, you can ask it to pull out, you know, tables and do all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah. So, that's just one piece in kind of the Elsevier um, suite. So, one of the, the sort of key products Elsevier office, offers are these sort of um, data sets, these data products that I mentioned earlier. So, these are domain specific, highly curated, um, that you can use for using to, for training internal models, for example. Um, the data enrichment and search and analytics, I've sort of touched on, that's the sort of side by piece. And then we do a lot of work um, in the sort of professional services space as well. So, helping you deploy this stuff, helping you understand how you can use semantics in your, in your data. Um, so that's me. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be around afterwards. And Elliot is over there as well from Elsevier if you'd like to come speak to us. Thank you.